alliance has been shaped by the progress of our shared home in the Asian Pacific, and it's been for decades. Underwriting stability, seeding commerce, laying the groundwork for this region to reach its great potential. And here, in the early years of what surely will be the Pacific century, it's critical that America and Australia continue to look to one another for mutual support. Because together, I am absolutely confident we can write a better future for all our children and for this whole region. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another Alliance at 70 United States Studies Center webinar. I'm Simon Jackman, Professor of Political Science and CEO of the US Studies Center here at the University of Sydney on Gadigal country, part of the Eora Nation, and we pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging into First Nations peoples, wherever you might be listening to us from today. We're honored uh, today to uh, be hosting a, a major address uh, by Senator Penny Wong, uh, Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs, and I'll introduce the Senator uh, a little more properly uh, in, in, in just a, a minute or two. Uh, but Senator Wong, uh, in addition to her remarks today, is also here uh, to help us launch uh, a report co-authored by Ashley Townsend, Susanna Patton, Toby Warden, and Tom there we are on screen now, Tom Corbin from uh, the center here, entitled Correcting the Course, How the Biden Administration Should Compete for Influence in the Indo-Pacific. And indeed, uh, Sen the Senator's remarks are going to address a, a, a very similar topic, focusing of course on the actions of the Australian government uh, in, in contributing uh, to US presence and in, indeed allied presence uh, in the, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, look, the context, of course, for today's remarks from the Senator and, of course, the report launch, um, it, it's been a big month here at the US Study Center and a big month uh, in terms of anniversaries. Uh, on the one hand, that we started the month with the 70th anniversary of ANZUS. We're all looking forward to Osman. And then, of course, um, right on the eve of Osman, um, the announcement about AUKUS, um, this new three-way partnership between Australia, the United States, and the United Kingdom. The media headline, um, of course, the, the provision in due course of, of nuclear submarines, acquisition of nuclear submarines, nuclear-powered submarines um, by Australia. That's the, I think, the piece that has obviously garnered the most media attention. But what the report does and the address by the Senator and indeed the discussion we'll have uh, in the, in the, on the balance of the time over this hour this morning is to really sort of get into the weeds a little more, both the reaction around the region, uh, but really assessing what it means for the topics we, we started with at the top, uh, what this means for advancing Australian national interests uh, in, in conjunction with allies and partners in the region. That is the main game, if you will, um, of, a, of Australian foreign policy at the moment. Of course, the events and announcements of the last week serving to sort of triple highlight that, if you will. Uh, um, let me now move on to formally introduce, um, 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 first of all, I'll briefly introduce um, the two report authors, and then I can properly introduce the Senator right before her remarks. Um, look, joining the Senator a little bit later in conversation will be um, the Director of our Foreign Policy and Defence Program here, Ash Townsend. Um, Ash has been with us for, for a number of years now. Um, he works on international security and strategic affairs with a focus on the Indo-Pacific, including regional alliances and partnerships, <clears throat> maritime security, defense policy, and US, Chinese, and Australian strategy. He is the founding convener and co-chair of the US-Australia Indo-Pacific Deterrence Dialogue, and he lectures occasionally here in the Center's postgraduate program as well, uh, uh, really key uh, to the Center's research presence and our policy uh, uh, facing output. Um, uh, joining us today, uh, uh, Susanna Patton, who has been with us just for a couple of months now, uh, a really significant hire for us here at the US Study Center, um, because up until quite recently, uh, Susanna was a senior analyst in the South, 
our, pardon me, Southeast Asia branch at ONI, the Office of National Intelligence, Australia's peak intelligence assessment agency. Uh, we are so thrilled to have Susanna and in particular to have that interchange between people who've been working in government and coming, stepping out into the think tank community. That is a feature of the US think tank ecosystem, something the US Study Center is really pleased to be starting to sort of get the ball rolling on, on those sorts of uh, uh, appointments uh, coming both in and back into, out and back into government. Uh, Susanna previously served in the ASEAN Australia Special Summit Task Force in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, and for a while was a diplomat herself in the Australian Embassy in Bangkok, and that regional specialization is gonna play special significance once we get into the discussion later on uh, today. And now, of course, uh, Senator the Honourable Penny Wong is leader of the opposition in the Senate and Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs. Uh, Senator Wong was elected to the Senate in 2001, taking her seat in 2002 and became a member of the Shadow Ministry in 2004. Uh, following the election of the Labor government in 2007, uh, Senator Wong was appointed Minister for Climate Change and Water. After the 2010 election, she was appointed Minister for Finance and Deregulation. In 2013, Senator Wong uh, became leader of the government in the Senate. Um, after the 2013 election, Senator Wong was appointed leader of the opposition in the Senate. Senator Wong is the first woman uh, to hold both of those roles. Uh, and um, we're delighted, given how busy those roles as leader of the opposition in the Senate, Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, we're, we're thrilled uh, to be hosting Senator Wong again. The last time we had the honour of, of hosting uh, Senator Wong was here in person uh, to, a, to a large audience here on the University of Sydney campus. Uh, Senator, it is great to have you with us again. Uh, we wish it were in person with a, with a large audience uh, in person. Um, but thank you for giving us your time. Thank you for delivering such a large audience to the United States Study Centre today. At last count, roughly 200 people are online with us today who have never attended a US Study Centre event before. Thank you for your time. Uh, the floor is yours, Senator. Thanks very much, Simon. Um, yes, it would have been nice to be there in person, but I'm glad we can do this uh, by Zoom. And I want to start by also acknowledging that I speak to you from Ghana land. Uh, and acknowledge my respect for the Ghana people's spiritual relationship with country and the cultural authority of Aboriginal people who are joining us from other areas of Australia. Can I um, say thank you, Simon, uh, Ashley, Susanna, uh, for arranging this discussion and for inviting me to launch your report on how the Biden administration should compete for influence in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, it is a frank and thoughtful assessment of the administration's approach to the region today, and I think a very useful scene setter for the upcoming release of the administration's broader Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, as you said, Simon, you know, we've, we've just seen the 70th anniversary of the Alliance and many more years than that of shared values and enduring friendship. It's a friendship forged in the fire of war and fulfilled in decades of peace and prosperity. In recent days, there has been a great deal of fanfare about the Morrison government's decision to enter into a tripartite partnership with the US and the UK, known as the AUKUS partnership. It is important to be clear at the outset, this is not a new treaty, nor is it a formal alliance. What it is, is an agreement to cooperate more closely on cyber, artificial intelligence, quantum technologies, and additional undersea capabilities and greater cooperation in these areas is a helpful step. And it's consistent with a long tradition of security cooperation with America. In recent years, most significantly with Prime Minister Gillard and President Obama working together to establish permanent marine rotations through Darwin. Of course, central to the announcement of August has been the government flagging an intention to acquire nuclear propelled submarines. The decisions, the actual decisions have been to end the existing attack class contract and to engage in an 18 month consultation before making any actual capability decision. It is worth pausing for a moment to consider the consequences of this cancellation decision. After eight years of government, this is the second submarine plan which has been scrapped. And like the first failed plan to purchase Japanese submarines, there are substantial costs Australia is bearing, not including the as yet unknown cancellation fees in the order of $4 billion 
has gone down the drain on the French contract with nothing to show for it. Further, some three decades after Labor government first commenced construction of the Collins class, we are back to square one on their replacement. Public reports indicate that the first such nuclear submarine we might acquire under these arrangements isn't likely to be operational until 2040. This is a story of missteps and mismanagement Australia can ill afford in the face of intensifying strategic competition. However, the decision to explore acquiring nuclear propelled submarines is a nevertheless a substantial one. And the Labor opposition will take a mature and considered approach. We have been briefed as to the rationale for nuclear propulsion being the best option for our future submarine program. And we accept the advice provided. But many questions and issues remain to be resolved. We have three conditions for the support of nuclear powered submarines on which we have short assurance. Firstly, there'd be no requirement for domestic civil nuclear industry. Secondly, there'd be no acquisition of nuclear weapons. And thirdly, that the agreement is compatible with the non-proliferation treaty. And the government has said these conditions can be met and we will hold them to these commitments. But more broadly, it is not unreasonable to expect the Morrison-Joyce government to inform the Australian people on the strategic, environmental, commercial and political ramifications and consequences of this decision, including valid questions about Australia's sovereign capability such as how will we control the use of technology and capability that is not ours? What implications are there for the design, assembly, operation and maintenance of nuclear powered submarines? And these are in addition to our concerns about how capability gaps will be managed, timeframe, costs and impact on Australian jobs. The Morrison government's defence strategic update last year stated that Australia could no longer rely on a decade of warning time for interstate conflict. It would be up to 18 years wait until we would get the first submarine under this announcement, let alone getting all late in the water. And there is an important here for Australia's sovereignty. There is an important question here for Australia's sovereignty. And it is a question that Mr Morrison cannot ignore. And it is a question that Malcolm Turnbull and Kevin Wright have alluded to over many years. With the prospect of a higher level of technological dependence on the United States, how does the Morrison-Joyce government assure Australians that we can act alone when need be, that we have the autonomy to defend ourselves, however and whenever we need to. All of these concerns will be priorities for Labor through the consultation phase over the coming months, whether from opposition or government, which is why Anthony Albanese has proposed a bipartisan consultation mechanism on this proposal. This partnership and this procurement cannot be at the mercy of changing political winds, particularly in this pre-caretaker period. This needs to be about the long-term national interest. And the handling of this multi-decade project on the eve of an election is a moment of truth for Mr Morrison's stewardship of the alliance. Will he bring the alternative government into the tent in pursuit of a shared national interest? Or will he do what he has done consistently on issues foreign and domestic, from the Jerusalem embassy decision to the Trump rally, to picking fights with premiers, and seek to use this as an opportunity to further his immediate political interests? He has yet to agree to Mr Albanese's proposal to take this out of the political world. He should. There's also been debate over this past week as to how AUKUS contributes to assuring Australia's interests in the region. The Indo-Pacific is being reshaped and the task for this generation of leaders and thinkers is to maximise Australia's influence on that reshaping. The first and obvious point is that AUKUS is additional to and not instead of Australia's contributions to regional architecture and alignments. It doesn't replace the ANZUS Alliance, the East Asia Summit, the ASEAN Regional Forum, APEC or the Quad. Central to maximising our influence in the region is looking to build greater alignment around matters which other regional partners share similar interests on. And the anxiety expressed in some of the reactions to the AUKUS announcement suggests that more preparatory work could have been done to assure our partners of the practical implications of these announcements, including compliance with our NPT obligations. Quite rightly, the, the region doesn't want a nuclear race. Mr Morrison needs to demonstrate in word and deed that AUKUS is not a precursor to more nuclear weapon states in, in Asia. And part of addressing these valid regional concerns is ensuring the great power competition that is defining our current era does not spiral into catastrophe. Southeast Asian nations have been clear. They do not want to be forced 
to pick sides in a US-China competition. They want to maintain their strategic autonomy and regional stability and to ensure ASEAN centrality. It's why for years now, I have said Australia needs to encourage and contribute to what I have called a settling point between the United States and China, what Kevin Rudd has called managed strategic competition and what Ashley and Susanna refer to as a statement of the US vision, the end state of strategic competition. And as their report makes clear, effective US competition in the region requires comprehensive economic outreach, not just strengthening the US's military presence. Deeper US economic integration will demonstrate the US can compete effectively, help address the region's needs and build shared prosperity. It is why Anthony Albanese emphasised the value of the US rejoining the CPTPP on the day that President Biden was inaugurated. But it is also up to Australia to lead within the alliance, to demonstrate our value add by being a partner of choice in the region, working with partners in the region to build our collective security, to diversify our export markets, to secure supply chains, provide renewable energy and climate solutions, avert, avert coercion, and respond to natural disasters. By investing financially and intellectually in the security and stability of our region, because defence capability on its own won't achieve this. We share with ASEAN states an abiding interest in averting hegemony by a single power. So this is where our energy must be applied. And our strategic ambitions must be matched by equally ambitious efforts to respond to the region's needs. This, of course, requires a bigger investment in our diplomacy, including our economic engagement and our development program. And it again reminds us why regional perspective should have been better factored in to how the government executed the AUKUS announcement. As this audience knows well, we face the most challenging set of strategic circumstances since the end of the Second World War. We are operating in an environment that requires Australia to work much harder to secure our interests. Submarines might help protect the region, but on their own, they won't build the region we want, a region that is stable, prosperous, as well as respectful of sovereignty. And submarines can help our national defence, but won't of themselves prevent efforts at economic coercion. Yet last week, Mr Morrison had an air of mission accomplished about him when the response to the announcement made painfully obvious that only a fraction of the job has been done. International reactions have highlight how much work there is to do with other partners in our region. The lack of diplomatic legwork has been most acutely observed by the French reaction. France ought to have been shown the due respect of a partner with shared Indo-Pacific interests. Instead, it's been reported that having failed to put in the work before the announcement, Members of the government are now describing the French as, and I quote, having a sort. Well, a marketing man should be able to tell you that perceptions, narrative and words matter, as well as understanding how negative perceptions can be used against the interests of the nation. You see, it won't just be France that might have doubts over whether Mr Morrison can be trusted as an honest partner. After a letter from his government saying they were satisfied with the project, the French subs project, was delivered to the Macron government on the same day as Mr Morrison's television announcement that the project was being dropped. So now while he's in the United States for the Quad Leaders meeting, Mr Morrison is in damage control rather than focusing only on advancing Australia's interests. As Simon said at the outset, uh, we, we, are in the, we are looking to a Quad Leaders Summit this week. So we appreciate and welcome the Biden administration's hosting of the first Quad Leaders Summit. With the momentum of the past year and promises made by its members, the Quad now has an opportunity to demonstrate its value in the region. It has always been clear that we will not prevail over COVID until we prevail over it everywhere. And the pledge of a billion vaccines for the region is a welcome step, but, we, but much more needs to be done both in the region but around, and around the world. So we welcome President Biden's uh, call this, this morning for the world to step up. As he said, we need to go big. And we look forward to seeing what specific commitments will be delivered to countries currently grappling with Delta outbreaks, including Indonesia. Because for all of the Morrison government's promises to deliver vaccines to Indonesia, we have seen piecemeal delivery and belated assistance. And we also hope to see progress within the Quad, Quad's climate change working group. President Biden has made this a priority within the Quad and across the US's global outreach. 
and Mr Morrison's failure to commit to net zero is leaving Australia behind and risks undermining our relationship with the US. It diminishes us in the region, thus hobbling our ability to add value to the Alliance as a partner of choice for our neighbours. From climate to health to security to critical technology, the Quad should have a positive regional agenda with practical outcomes. Our partnerships and alliances across the region, including the Quad, are our advantage. But Australia needs to show we can lead the way and deliver for our regional partners, especially for those people of Southeast Asia and the Pacific. In conclusion, President Biden's leadership within the Quad underscores the indispensable, albeit changed nature of US power and US influence and how this has evolved to ensure the central role of allies and partners in achieving our shared interests in the region. And these are to uphold the rules of the road, provide balance and build the region we want. Not by relying on unhelpful binaries that reinforce existing prejudices of Australia in the region or reduce our complex environment to Cold War analogies. There is no scenario in which China doesn't matter and no responsible scenario where we can opt out of engagement. Equally, we know China is becoming more assertive and at times aggressive, which when combined with its military modernization pro program often reduces our strategic policy debate to two fatalisms. The first, that China's rise is inevitable and immune to accountability and we just need to get used to it. Second, that conflict is inevitable and we just need to get used to that. Well, we've got to move past that thinking. Australia should always act in our national interests, not through the prism of great power competition. At times, this means disagreeing with the US as we did when former President Trump rejected the global rules-based order. But also, it also means adding real value to our relationship with the United States through our partnerships in the region. It requires Australia, to quote Bob Paul, to be self-reliant within the alliance. As I have said for many years, as a US ally, the fact is Australia long ago made a choice. But that is not the end of the matter. So I, and finally, I'm so pleased to be part of launching this report and such a valuable contribution from Susanna, Ash, and from the Centre to effective US engagement in the region. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you, Senator. Um, by prior arrangement, um, I'm going to direct a, a, a few uh, opening questions to Ash and to Susanna to reflect um, on elements of, of the Senator's speech. Ash, first to you, um, in the Senator's conclusion, uh, the, the observation uh, that Biden's leadership in the Quad, quote, underscores the indispensable uh, nature of US power and influence in the Indo-Pacific. Um, look, since you finished, literally the ink got dry on the report, in the, in the intervening weeks, um, we've had, of course, the, the AUKUS announcement, um, some specifics around US-Australia force posture. And now um, we've got uh, later this week, uh, the first ever Quad Leader Summit. I'm wondering, has anything changed in, in the midst of those announcements and developments, change anything uh, that you put into the report? Thanks, Simon. Um... It certainly has been a momentous uh, couple of weeks for US Indo-Pacific policy and certainly for Australia and, and, and our alliance with the United States. I think it's important to recall here that the core of our argument really boiled down to, to two things. First, the US uh, hasn't uh, and hasn't for some time decisively prioritized the Indo-Pacific as its core regional focus, nor articulated a vision for the end state of strategic competition with China, which, which in our view um, is, a, is a process, is, is an undesirable phenomenon and is certainly not a plan for the region. Um, as Senator Wong just said, what we want is to see the United States go big in Asia and big across all domains of regional power and influence. And this still hasn't happened. Um, now, we're waiting for the Biden administration to release its Indo-Pacific strategy in the coming days and weeks. Um, and, and we do have some reason to be uh, optimistic uh, that the Biden administration is paying more attention to um, regional issues as opposed to a global competition with China. But even the president's uh, speech at the United Nations General Assembly this week, uh, where he flip-flopped on the importance of the Indo-Pacific relative to other parts of the world, 
and we might give that to him considering it is the United Nations, but does go to this key issue that for a long time and since the rebalance to Asia was articulated a decade ago, the United States has still not focused and directed the lion's share of its resourcing to the Indo-Pacific. And that worries Australia and that worries US allies and partners in the region. Um, to the point about the global versus the regional, and again, a point that Susanna and I and our other co-authors stress a lot in the report, um, we haven't yet seen necessarily decisive change on that point. The AUKUS agreement is very important from the perspective of empowering two decades from now, in the case of the submarines, um, uh, Australia, a key US ally in the region, to do more for its own security and to play a bigger role in collectively upholding and stewarding a, a favorable balance of power in the region. And there has been, in the US context, very significant movement on that front. We've wanted sensitive US technology for decades, including nuclear propulsion technology. US allies always want the top shelf technology from the United States where they can get it, but the United States has not always been willing to share it. So we have seen a shift and a sea change, pardon the pun, um, on this particular issue. Um, the United States has done a similar thing with the Republic of Korea earlier this year, where it again changed a key, um, a, a key element of its ballistic missile control regime to enable South Korea to more effectively defend itself against North Korea and in the context of a rising China. Uh, but these things, as Senator Wong made quite clear, um, are not going to pay dividends in the immediate term in the Indo-Pacific. They won't boost US influence in the jostling for power and position that is going on right now. And they are no supplement for an effective, comprehensive strategy uh, in the region. Uh, so from, from, from my perspective, the, the military piece and the alliance empowerment piece is moving in the right direction and I think we'll see more, but you can get this part of the regional puzzle right and get the Indo-Pacific strategy writ large quite wrong. Okay. Uh, Susanna, um, same question to you. Um, how do developments of recent weeks, how do they change or not um, the assessment um, that you put forward uh, and your contribution to the report about US Indo-Pacific strategy? Thanks, Simon. I mean, I very much agree with what Ash said. Um, we're still seeing the evolution of the Biden administration's approach to the Indo-Pacific, and we're still waiting for key policy documents that will provide us with a better sense of it. So the Indo-Pacific strategy, the national security strategy, and so on. At this point, what we're really seeing is individual initiatives, but it's a bit hard to tell what they amount to. Um, and if I can use a, a metaphor that will be familiar for Australian viewers, uh, we're in a kind of Mr. Squiggle stage of US Asia strategy. That is to say, we can see individual components of what the US is doing, like AUKUS and like the Quad Leaders Summit, but it's still a bit hard to tell what the overall picture is going to be in terms of a cohesive Asia strategy. Um, and as we set out in our report, one of the key things that is really missing is an economic strategy, which Senator Wong touched on in her speech. There really is no alternative way of signalling the US intention to remain committed to the region and to indicate that its presence is a benign and mutually beneficial one. And that's especially important in Southeast Asia. And it needs to be a trade-based approach because infrastructure will take years, if not decades, to be delivered if it relies on leveraging the private sector. But I think the good news is that the administration has shown that it can pivot, if I can use a loaded term. It sent high-level visitors to Southeast Asia after it was criticised for not doing enough there. With AUKUS, it's done something that no one anticipated in terms of technology sharing, and it's done those things because the strategic stakes are very high. It has the most Asia expertise, um, possibly of any US administration. So I think Australia should continue to be quite ambitious and pushy in terms of our demands of the administration and that means not giving up in terms of the economic side despite the well-known political challenges that that poses in the United States. Terrific Susanna. Uh, look there's a lot coming onto the table in your, in your responses. Um, I'd, I'd like to direct a, a question back to the to the senator now uh, picking up 
on uh, some elements of the speech and look at, and if this were an in-person event, the, the back and forth among the three of you would, would happen a little more naturally. I, I may force feed that over the remaining half hour that, we, that we've got. Um, so, um, but please do jump in um, and um, in response to one another, if, if, if that's possible. Senator, um, in the speech, um, you said that AUKUS raised an important question for Australian sovereignty, uh, and that is namely how to manage uh, the higher level of technological dependence on the US that it necessarily entails, and to ensure that Australia has the autonomy to act alone and defend ourselves when we need to. Um, look, how difficult is that going to be? And how concerned are you um, that you are that Australia is at risk of, of, of falling short of that aspiration? As you said, Bob Hawke uh, famously uh, talked about self-reliance self within an alliance context? Mm -hmm. uh, thanks very much for the question. And I think I thank um, Ash and Susanna for those very uh, insightful uh, responses to your opening questions. I'm trying to work out if I can get a Mr. Squiggle analogy into any answer, but I don't think it's I'll good, be able isn't to it? it. was very clever. <laughs> um, but look, I'd, I'd make, you know, we've been consistent in supporting the AUKUS or AUKUS, as I think Ash and Susanna want to um, have been using. Um, and we've, Labor's indicated we, we've been briefed and we, as I said in the speech, we accept the case that's been made on capability. But I think it is entirely reasonable to talk about, to talk about how these new arrangements will be implemented. Um, look, the principal benefit or, that we have derived from our relationship with the United States, including the Alliance, uh, has been access, or I suppose, well, I think Kim Bleasley always talks about it as a force multiplier. It's been access to advanced technology, to intelligence, and re over more recent years, as I go to in the speech, greater interoperability. So I think this new arrangement is uh, not entirely new in terms of kind or character, but it is different in terms of degree. So we just have to think through, as we have with uh, previous arrangements, how it is we ensure we retain our independent decision-making capacity in circumstances where there is a, a, a greater degree of technological dependence. And we need to ensure that the arrangements that we enter into reflect, you know, that desire, desire for um, our own st sovereign strategic capability. Um, Ash, I'll, I'll ask you to, to pick up on that as a, as a long-term student, um, long-time student of Australia's alliance relationship with the US in particular. This issue looms large, not just about the nuclear submarines, but... Um, pick a platform, uh, pick a moment uh, in, in the Alliance's maturation over the years. Um, the issue of technological dependence and, and does it, as, as, as the Senate referred to, uh, echoing uh, uh, our good friend Kim Beasley, force multiplier versus the dependency side. Um, I'm wondering if you've got a, a, a take on that sort of drawing over the perhaps a, the, the long view of, of the Alliance. Look, thanks, Simon. Um, I, I think both things uh, can be true simultaneously, and it's a balance Australia has always had to strike between accessing and having a military that is technologically reliant on the United States, as is currently the case, but also one that is self-reliant within that context and able to have sufficient capacity to service, maintain and operate Australian sovereign military capabilities by itself at a time and choosing of our own. Um, and I think it's going to be critical for Australia as the terms and conditions around AUKUS or AUKUS or whatever the Americans call it, um, uh, get bashed out over the coming weeks. Um, the way I see AUKUS is that it is a, it has the potential to, to deliver to Australia something we've wanted for a long time, which is not just the submarine propulsion technology, but a capacity for defence and technological um, industrial base integration that would allow Australia both to access the most effective technology from within the tent, so to speak, a kind of defence tree free trade zone, as my colleague, former colleague Brendan Thomas Noon always talked about, but at the same time also put more Australian innovation back into the US system. The US, Australia and the UK can together share that kind of technology in ways that other partners simply can't. That's already true. And that gives us a capacity to do more. 
But in that context, it's important that we make sure that we get the kind of US support for technology transfer and the transfer of technical know-how that will allow Australia to graft bigger and better capability in our own local sovereign defence industry. That's going to be critical to the way that the government implements a sustainment maintenance and logistics hub for you know, allied submarines, which is the talking point coming out of Osman last week, and I'll be watching for those details. And I think scrutiny of that decision is going to be key to making sure that it does pay that kind of dividend to Australia. Um, let me just finish with one point. Simon, as you say, you know, our, our military is already technologically integrated, right? Our, our anti-submarine warfare aircraft, the P-8s, have their engines maintained by Americans in the United States. Our F-35s, our electronic uh, warfare airplanes uh, rely on U.S. sensitive mission data. You know, the Australian military can only talk to itself because of U.S. satellites and technologies and systems that are integral to a networked 21st century military. We're in this deeply. That is not going to change. And I think we haven't yet seen that Australia has faced um, sort of leverage by the senior partner in the alliance to do things that we wouldn't otherwise do using that technological dependence as a weapon. Now, of course, people might argue that the general um, alliance management um, instincts of Australian governments have been the reason why we've become embroiled in conflicts of peripheral interest to Australian uh, security, as I have myself, and that certainly includes the last 20 years in the Middle East. But the notion that the United States you know, has to fight for primacy in Asia in order to be able to keep maintaining our submarines, or on the other hand, that this inevitably integrates us into US war plans over Taiwan, I think overstates the way that um, when junior allies become more technologically powerful, they actually have enhanced bargaining power within the alliance. Um, the Cold War has shown us that in the European context, certainly shown us that in the nuclear context. And I think that is uh, something that we should bear in mind as we look to how this uh, detail unfolds for Australia. Um, of course, Senator, always, um, if, if you want to react to, to that, um, um, Delighted to have you, have your way in on that, um, but otherwise, uh, I might. Oh, no, um, I thought that I thought yeah, was a good it, answer, yep. for Bash. Actually, <laughs> what's that? I thought his was a very good answer because he, he went <laughs> to yeah, but because he went to you know, I think these the, the point that we have reasonable that they are, the the arrangements should reflect some of the imperatives both on capability but also on our technological base that that Ash went to. I think was was a sound one. I agree with it. Thanks, Senator. Hey. Um, Let's, if I may, um, AUKUS set <laughs> the announcements thick and fast, but look, the, the other big bit of news that will come out sort of uh, is, is, look, the Prime Minister's in Washington, the, the first quad leaders meeting um, about to sort of dominate um, news coverage over the next uh, couple of days, I imagine. Um, in the speech, Senator, um, you noted uh, the promise of the quad uh, as a new or newly elevated piece of regional architecture. Um, look, a, a key way that Australia's always worked to try and draw the US into Asia has been through uh, regional architecture and, and indeed, um, you know, uh, previous Labor governments have, have, uh, have ruled uh, triumphs to point to there. And, I, and I've got APEC in mind and, and the East Asia Summit being some of that regional architecture um, that, that Australia's played uh, a key role and a key role vis-a-vis -vis the United States uh, respect. Um, now, I'm just wondering your take on the quad in, in terms of that tradition of regional architecture as, as vehicles for helping draw uh, the US into the region in a way that uh, advances Australian national interests. Your, your assessment of the quad to date or where you think it's going uh, from that particular point of view? Uh, well, look, for first proposition, obviously, constructive, effective US engagement in the region is, is indispensable, um, uh, um, which we've spoken about. Uh, secondly, you're right, uh, previous uh, Labor governments or Australian governments have ensured or were looked at architectural arrangements as one of the means, as well as other interoperability um, uh, initiatives to ensure there is US deep and effective US engagement in the region and with us. Um, the, uh, I think the Quad is, problem, is consistent with that approach, as you said, APEC and EAS. Uh, so it's not 
new in, in that sense. And it's not new in the sense that it has been around since 2004, I think it was, was it, as a result of the, as a, as a way of dealing with the a nat nat natural disaster of the, of the tsunami. Um, I suppose what is new about it, though, is that it, it demonstrates the willingness, and I think this is a good thing, of countries of uh, engagement in smaller, uh, perhaps more flexible or multi mini-lateral groupings uh, as part of creating that, that balance that we want here yeah, as our region is being reshaped uh, for, for uh, you know, to ensure the sort of region we want non-hegemonic, rules of the road are respected, etc. So I suppose that's the newer element in that you know, we're really looking to, um, at leader level, have uh, these, these minilateral uh, flexible arrangements. Um, so I think it is a good initiative, uh, but as I said, I, I see these alignments and these groups, uh, and I listed them in speech, uh, you know, we, we have to work through a whole range of different fora in order to generate as much alignment as possible because that is the best way for us to influence the reshaping of the region that is going on uh, as we speak. Um, Susanna, I, I wonder if, given your expertise with, with Southeast Asia, um, I'm wondering how, you know, the same, getting your reaction to the same question, um, the quad as a, as a piece of regional architecture. Uh, it's uh, what we need to see from it um, from, from an Australian uh, point of view. Thanks, Simon. I think the point that I would make about this is that um, we are seeing a kind of erosion of the region's inclusive architecture, which is not because of the Quad, but because the intensification of US-China competition has meant that the aspirations that countries like Australia once had for the East Asia Summit in terms of a forum for political security dialogue, I think today are much more limited. And we're also seeing the continued um, diminishing of APEC as well. It's very promising that the US has announced an offer to host APEC in 2023, but it remains quite a diminished forum because serious trade discussions are happening elsewhere. So I think it's really important for Australia to be articulating a new kind of pragmatic rationale for strong US engagement in the EAS and other regional architecture. Firstly, because it prevents um, China from dominating. We know that China is very adept at using regional forums. It will be there regardless of whether the United States is. Um, I think secondly, those regional forums, the inclusive ones really help drive US focus and attention on the region. Around 70% of President Obama's travel to Asia was associated with a regional meeting of some kind. So those opportunities are really important in terms of focusing US attention. And finally, I think they can be a good opportunity on certain sort of transactional objectives. It could be climate and energy, for example, given US interests. Um, so the Quad is very important as a signaling mechanism to China in particular, but it doesn't perform the same role. So I think it's really important that we continue to have a strong focus on, on both avenues, the inclusive forums and the quad. Um, fine, um, a question for all, all three, um, the Senator Ash and, and Susanna. Um, look, in addition to AUKUS, the other big announcement this past week um, was some of the initiatives um, around uh, expanded force posture uh, by the US in Australia, uh, including air, land, sea. Um, Look, um, this initiative, though, um, of, of having US uh, boots on the ground in particular, um, um, I, I go back to the Gillard government announcing the rotational presence of, of US Marines in Darwin and the hope that that would uh, further embed uh, the US in the region. I'm wondering, Senator, um, from your perspective, um, what does um, the ideal US defence posture in Australia look like? And and, and strategically, what role should that uh, presence play? <laughs> in in um, 500 words or less. Well, look, I mean, I think at the principal level, uh, it is um, uh, 
uh, it is a presence which is consistent with a constructive and, US, and effective US regional engagement. Uh, it should look to security cooperation with partners in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, it should um, enable cooperation, you know, on the broad gamut of security issues. Um, so, you know, obviously natural disasters, maritime law enforcement, uh, broader law enforcement issues um, um, as well. And it should be consistent with the recognition of the changing role, an evolving role of US power in the region, which is, you know, US is indispensable to the balance that we seek in this region. We no longer live in a unipolar world and it should reflect that. Thanks. Um, Ash, same question to you. Thanks, Simon. Uh, briefly here, as a lot of the work we've done at the centre has, has focused on um, the US um, military strategic position in the Indo-Pacific, which again is only a part of the basis of a stable order, is, is, is atrophying at the moment. It is not robust and it is unlikely um, to be robust unless allies and partners pick up a larger slice of the burden in terms of helping to sustain that presence. Um, successive white papers, defence and foreign, successive governments of both sides of politics have called for the strongest possible US security engagement in the region. And since 2011, Australia has played a much more substantial role in supporting that. Um, um, but it is a decisive decision for any Australian government to host additional US forces, but a necessary one if we want to have a United States that is enabled here in the region. For instance, the biggest focus um, of the force posture initiatives announced last week or flagged last week, the details are yet to be revealed or, 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 um, or confirmed, I believe, um, but is, is not actually a base is not actually more US military units, so to speak, in Australia, but is the sustainment, maintenance and logistics hub, the prepositioning of US equipment in the region, which will shorten timelines for the United States to get to the region to provide a degree of security goods to the region from HADR to high-end deterrence and everything in between. US posture in Southeast Asia um, is rocky in many respects, as I, as I think Susanna will touch on in a moment. Um, but but uh, and, and therefore, Australia must play a role here. So the ideal form of that is going to be something that is constantly evolving. Um, uh, but one way of putting everything might be this. You know, Australia and uh, Japan and South Korea have for a long time hosted substantial US forces and really lifted that allied burden in Northeast Asia. I think 20, 30 years from now, the kind of US presence that we sustain here in Australia won't look like that, but it will look a lot more ambitious than it does right now because there aren't alternatives. Uh, Susanna, same question for you uh, about um, reaction to the expanded force posture initiatives and uh, perhaps what's the ideal level um, for Australia? I might just say very briefly, just in terms of the, the regional views of the Force Posture Initiative, when it was first announced in 2011, um, at that time, Indonesia did express some concerns, but subsequently became more positive. And we've even seen some combined exercises, include, including regional defence forces, um, with the rotational deployment of, of US Marines. So that's, that's really positive. And I think um, there has been a good news story there to a certain extent, which is that regional countries, I think, understand that Australia's concerns are about China and that our strategic policy is not directed against countries in Southeast Asia, which was, of course, once a concern. So that, that is positive. But obviously, the regional reaction from notably from Indonesia and Malaysia to the AUKUS announcement um, does indicate that there are some concerns about the direction that we're traveling in, which is some Thing that Australia will, will need to manage. Um, and I think those concerns very much centre around not the idea that we're targeting the region, but that um, 
but that all countries, um, including both the United States and China, are destabilising the regional security environment and causing tensions, um, which is a very harmful perception um, for the United States and, and by extension for Australia. So I think it's really important that we find new ways of talking about regional security. I don't think it's enough for um, Australian or US leaders to merely assert that um, our activities promote regional security. I think that has to be demonstrated um, rather than asserted. Um, and that goes to the importance of the economic engagement, the delivery of public goods like vaccines. So I guess my response to the question is that, um, is that forced posture and other defence initiatives have to be within a broader context of policy, which is, um, which is balanced. That's excellent. Great observation, Susanna, thank you. And mm -hmm. um, look, um, Senator, you'll be aware that uh, we have a, a sister centre out at, in Western Australia, the Perth US Asia Centre. Um, like us, they've recently had the great privilege of having um, um, uh, someone at a similar career stage, uh, um, not a similar career stage, Susanna joining them from the Australian Public Service. Hayley Channer uh, um, was with them for a time. She's now on a, on a Fulbright off, off to the United States. But um, I'd, I'd, I'd love to bring a question from Hayley in and I'll just read it. Um, Hayley asks, um, uh, how do you, all three of you, how do you think the AUKUS deal will be discussed at the Quad on Friday uh, and interestingly, will India in particular require a lot of reassurance? One former Indian foreign minister has not appreciated the AUKUS announcement. Do you think New Delhi will be pragmatic uh, about this new Australia-US-UK deal, um, Senator? Uh, well, can I say I hope that the Morrison government has done a bit more lead work with uh, India than it appears to have done with the French. Um, and uh, I would hope that the Quad discuss leader level discussions are an opportunity uh, for uh, the AUKUS announcement uh, uh, of the partnership, um, <clears throat> uh, as well as the flagging of the intention to acquire, uh, acquire uh, nuclear propelled submarines could be discussed in so, so as to ensure that any uh, concerns or so there is clear understanding from the Indians perspective about uh, this being consistent as, as Susanna said with uh, you know, an approach that, that they share as to regional stability and regional security. So I, I hope there is um, that, that sort of discussion um, uh, in the coming days. Uh, Susanna, um, again, your regional expertise, I think relevant in, um, I'd be very curious in your reaction to Hayley's question. I think the sense is that India is, is broadly speaking very comfortable with the AUKUS arrangement. And that's because um, uh, I guess in a way reflecting its motivations for participating in the Quad now in a way that it once wasn't prepared to, India sees that its interests um, lie in strong regional initiatives that help um, balance against the risk of, of China um, becoming uh, too dominant in the region. And so even if India itself would not be willing to sign up to um, some initiatives that, for example, Australia, um, the US and, for example, Japan are, um, or in the case of the AUKUS arrangement, um, they're still happy to see that go ahead by other countries. Ash, just wondering, you got anything to add to the, this question from Hayley? I mean, briefly, to, to, to pivot a bit to the, to the defence component of that question, um, again, AUKUS is and should be and must be about the United States empowering allies to help themselves to do more and to be, 
to, to, to pursue the kinds of capabilities and technologies that they believe they want and need to protect themselves and their friends in the Indo-Pacific. In India's case, um, there is still a long-standing dispute between the United States and India over whether or not the Biden administration will in some form sanction India over its decision to procure Russian air defense missile systems, the S-400, uh, due to concerns about the proliferation or the presence rather of Russian technology in the Indian military, which is as dependent on Russia as ours is on the United States and is a reality that India can't change. And also due to concerns of uh, you know, from the Trump era of, of US allies um, uh, getting closer to Russia, which uh, was viewed and of course isn't a good thing. But again, in India's case, it's more of a degree of path dependency and what's feasible. So I think that you know, the, you know, the Indian delegation at the Quad meeting will be asking questions. If you're going to give Australia all of this new technology, including nuclear propulsion, will you be uh, dropping the threat that you've had over our heads for the last you know, two years over the CATSA deal and the S-400? And of course, that is something that is the administration, I think, really does need to take seriously. The United States is not Unipol anymore. The United States isn't able to defend the Indo-Pacific by itself, it will need the goodwill and the participation of others, most especially India. And so I think that if AUKUS is going to have a larger payoff for the Quad, that would be a good start point. That's great, Ash. Thanks for, that's a, that's a deep below the fold insight there about the dependency of India um, um, uh, on, on, on Russia and some of those issues sort of going on between India and the US. Um, thanks for bringing that to the table. Hey, look, um, we're coming down. We're less than five minutes to go, um, and we will end on time. Um, I, I want to get one more question in, and and it's something. Look, it, Senator, this has been qu quite a lively topic here among us at the US Study Center, and it goes to the way that the US uh, under Biden they've been talking a big game about democratic values as being front and center um, in their approach to foreign policy, uh, the Indo-Pacific included. Um, and, and indeed, you know, Biden in his remarks at Congress really framing, you know, talking about a battle for the 21st century um, at a systems level between authoritarianism and democracy. Um, uh, Prime Minister Morrison's sort of talking about, you know, a, a world order that, that favors freedom. Um, I guess the question is, is that the right framework, putting democratic values so front and, and centre? Is that always the right way to go uh, for mm. both Australia and, and, and the US in the region, uh, charting strategies for an Indo-Pacific future? So I'm going to start with, um, I suppose, a Labor realist frame, which is we, we take the world as it is and we seek to shape it for the better. So what does that mean in this context? Well, um, uh, of course, the shaping for the better part is a recognition that you know, we are a, a democracy and we, we believe um, democracy uh, is important. It is both an interest and a value. Uh, and we should reflect that uh, in our behaviours internationally and at home. So, you know, I have argued for the introduction of Magnitsky legislation to add to our toolkit to send a strong message around on human rights. Um, I think we should live up to these values at home. And I think the recent debate over um, political donations and you know, Mr. Mr. Porter's um, uh, anonymous donation and the, the, the failure of the government to have real time disclosure of donations, I think we should, we should live up to these at home. Um, but I think we also, if I go back to the first part of what I say, we take the world as it is, we need to recognise in our region that not everybody in this region with whom we share interests has the same view about the importance of democracy. Now, on that, we, we may not agree with them, but that doesn't mean that we can't work with them uh, in terms of uh, aligning on those issues which matter to both of us or all of us uh, and in terms of the shaping of the region we want. So an obvious example is we work, uh, and the, the Morrison government works closely with Vietnam on issues associated with the um, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea uh, and 
um, you know, in relation to the South China Sea and, and, and other parts of the region uh, and the way in which all class matters. So I, I make the point that you know, we, we have to generate alignment and work to generate that alignment with countries which have very different political systems. And I think it comes back to the point Susanna made, I think in answer to, to maybe the third or fourth question where she said, you know, you have to uh, approach, um, you have to demonstrate that you're serious about regional stability and you have to demonstrate all the things that you are doing as a nation, not just talking about do submarines or talking about where um, marines are, are rotated through, um, you need to demonstrate that to the region. So um, I think uh, we have a clear position on human rights, but we need to also recognise the need to generate alignment with other nations in the region who may have very different political systems. Thanks, Senator. And Susanna, I'm going to give you very briefly, literally 30 seconds, if you, if you might, just given the regional focus of that question, I think it's really great if we could hear from you on this interest versus values dimension. I think that uh, supporting democracy and human rights um, is something that Australia and the United States should be doing in their foreign policies. I think the key distinction to make clear, though, is that that in itself is not the same thing as competing with China. I think um, where Ash and I have written is to say that uh, we shouldn't conflate the ideas of a competition with China being a competition between democracies and autocracies, because actually the true source of China's competitive advantage in the region is on economic issues. And if we cast the competition in this way, then we risk losing it. Well said again, Susanna, that, that's, that's a great way to end our hour today. Um, I wanna thank again, the Senator uh, Penny Wong for joining us this morning. Um, I don't know if you're in Canberra or South Australia, um, but wherever you are, Senator, thanks in Adelaide, for getting in Adelaide. good. A little, well, a little earlier than here on the east, but not too. Not it's not early. Um, thank you, thank you for joining us. Uh, to Ash and Susanna, uh, thank you so much for the work you're doing at the Senate at the moment. Really hitting, putting some big runs on the board for the Senate. The debate is fast moving. The announcements are, are coming thick and fast. Uh, the work of the centre, very, very important at this time in, this, in the Alliance's evolution and, and, and its centrality to the pursuit of Australian national interests. That's, that, so it's great work that you're doing. And I want to thank also Janine, who makes these webinars run so seamlessly for us, Taylor for the fabulous play on 30 second video with, with the Biden voiceover. Um, help make the show all that much more professional uh, here at the US Study Centre. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, and, and do keep an eye on the website for upcoming webinars. Um, we'll be bringing those to you over the weeks and months ahead. Thank you again, everybody. Good morning. Thank you.